Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the service this Sunday. Uh, do we have any visitors today? Lali? I have a visitor. Welcome. Do you want to share where you are from? Welcome. Okay, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you that this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, as we come to worship today, we just ask and acknowledge your presence, and that may your Holy Spirit be upon us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I will be lighting the candle, it's a sign of God's presence with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, would you stand with us as we prepare our hearts to worship? And so, gracious Father, we thank you that we are able to gather here and we just ask that you would allow us to know the moving of your spirit, that we could be very aware of your presence. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> you to be seated. Let's 
So I'd like to ask, uh, does anybody, is there anybody who has a birthday today? Any celebrations? Nobody getting old? Okay, and your son's name? Happy birthday to Charles. <laughs> anybody else celebrating anything? Birthday, anniversary? Yes, at the back. Sorry? Yeah, happy birthday. God bless you today. God bless you today. God bless you and keep you. God bless you always. Anybody else uh, celebrating anything today? It is Heritage Weekend, and uh, just to those who are dressed for Heritage Day, uh, you look absolutely amazing, and it's really good to be part of such a beautiful and colorful country. Uh, any other good news that we're celebrating? Yes, I've got good news. Yes. I got saved for another night to see another beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Anything else that anybody is celebrating? Karen. Wow, that's fantastic. Don't know if everyone heard, uh, Sharice's scans have come back. We've been praying for her for a while, and she's in remission. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Heather Hemus also in remission at the moment. So good to hear all of these good news stories. Uh, thank you to everyone for sharing. Uh, the other good news is that next week is our opening. Uh, we will be having a combined service at 8.30, and there will be food afterwards. Apparently, there's prego rolls, potato salad, coleslaw, pop, sauce, chakalaka, uh, yeah. sushi, <laughs> ach, not sushi, slush puppies. I think I'm this for sushi, sorry. And ice cream, apparently. Okay, so on that note, uh, would you stand with me? As we pray together, let us pray. So gracious Father, we thank you for all the good things of this life. We thank you that every good gift comes from you. Thank you that we can gather and worship you on this beautiful morning. Thank you for this incredible country that we are a part of. May we be people who bring your good news to life for so many others. And so, Lord, thank you that you invite us to be part of the work that you are doing. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> amen. Uh, we're going to be singing together. We're going to be worshiping together. There might be one or two songs that you haven't heard before. Uh, please try them. If you can't sing with, uh, listen to the lyrics and the words, and I'm sure you'll catch on in the choruses. But let's praise God together. Father, the love of God. 
mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He's got a hold on my life. I found Jesus. I'm good. I'm one more. I'm restored. I'm restored and made right. He's got a hold on my life. I've got Jesus. I'm good. I'm one more. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. And so, gracious Father, we are truly undone by your goodness and your grace. And there are many times in this life where we fall short, where we are trapped in sin, where we live in shame, where we allow guilt to rob us of your goodness. And we just thank you that you are an awesome God who reaches out and saves us even when we don't deserve it. So may we continue to praise you as our awesome God. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen.
unravel me with a melody you surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear cause I am a child So today we are continuing our sermon series, The Bible Starts With Grace. I don't know, has anybody that's here today, has anybody been uh, to all four of the different sermons, heard all four of them? Uh, Karen at the back, a few people. Uh, it's so good. It's been amazing to, for those of you who are visiting or those who haven't been part of this journey, for the last four weeks, we've looked at the first couple of stories of the Bible. So we looked at... Uh, 
Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah's Ark. And today we're looking at Abraham and Sarah, and we've looked at how the grace of God was evident in every one of those stories. At just how God's hand and God's nature and God's grace was there from the beginning of time. And Trevor Hudson once said that the most important thing in your life is your image of God. Who you think God is, is the most important thing in your life because that will determine who you become. And so if God for you is this uh, God who is angry and judgmental, chances are that we will become angry and judgmental of ourselves and others. If God is gracious and loving, that we will receive God's grace and God's love and we will pass God's grace and God's love on. And that's why over the last few weeks we've been looking at the grace of God in the beginning. From next week, we are starting our new sermon series, uh, which is called The Reset Button. And that is about how we can live our lives today, making good choices that are God-honoring, seen as though we've come out of a pandemic. All of our lives have changed in one way or another. And if we live by default, this is what Gordon MacDonald says, if we live by default instead of design, we will become someone we never wanted to be. And so it's about making choices that are God-honoring in every part of our life. And that's what we'll start looking at from next week. But for today, we are looking at the story of Abraham and Sarah. And so I'd like to read from Genesis chapter 18, uh, from verse 1 through to verse 15. A little bit of context is that Abraham and Sarah left their hometown when they were about 75. Uh, they walked to different lands. They've resettled in a different land. God gave them the promise that they would be the parents or Abraham would be the father of a great nation. But to date, they haven't had any children. So Abraham and Sarah decide to take matters into their own hand and they convince Abraham to uh, sleep with his servant, and so she has a son called Ishmael, but then Ishmael and his mom weren't very nice to Sarah, and so they were asked to leave the home and fend for themselves, and now they are very, very old. Abraham is 99, Sarah is 90, uh, and this is what happens next. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat. So you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sears of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years. What a nice way of putting it. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? 
I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Thanks be to God for his word. I'd just like to invite us to watch uh, the short video uh, telling the story of Abraham and Sarah from a child's perspective. So this is where we are in this story. God made a perfect world, but people messed it up. God started the whole earth over again with an enormous flood, but he saved one guy and his family. And everything was good again, but after lots and lots of years, it seemed like not much had changed. People were still selfish. Still me. And the world still wasn't how God wanted it to be. So God decided to fix everything that had gone wrong. With one very special family. That's where Abram comes in. Abram was an old man, 75. That's old. Before Abram even knew who God was, he heard him speaking to him. God told Abram to leave his home and go to a new country. Imagine if God told you to move far away, like tomorrow. To Canada. Or Uzbekistan. Well, Abram did it. He left his home and went where God told him to go. And God told Abram that he would make him to a great nation. Which was a big deal because a great nation meant lots of kids. And grandkids? And great grandkids. But Abram didn't have any kids. Remember, he was 75. And that's pretty old. And his wife, Sarai, was 65. Kids never ask a woman how old she is. So God's promise seemed kind of unlikely. Not just unlikely, impossible. But Abram believed. So he waited and waited <sighs> and waited some more. <sighs> For almost 25 years. And when Abram was 99 years old, God told him again that he would have a son. And as part of this promise, God changed Abram's name to Abraham, and Abraham's wife became Sarah. So Abram was now Abraham. And Sarai was Sarah. As a way for them to remember God's promise to them. The promise that they would have a son. God even told Abraham what to name his son. Isaac. And God said Isaac would have two sons of his own. Abraham's family would keep growing and growing and growing. Sarah still had a hard time believing this. She even laughed at God. She was 90 after all. But God always keeps his promises. And a year later, Isaac was born. And years and years later, another special baby was born into the same family. His name was Jesus. Have you heard of him? But just think. If Abraham had stayed home and ignored God, maybe none of that would happen. But that's another part of the story. There's a story about a little boy. I'm going to call him Dave. And Dave went to children's church for one Sunday. And at children's church, they told him the story of Moses. Uh, you know the story of Moses? Uh, so they told him the story of Moses and how Moses crossed the Red Sea. So when Dave got home, his mother was interested and said to him, Dave, um, can you tell me what happened at children's church? What happened at Sunday school today? So little Dave sat down. He said, let me tell you. He says it was the story of Moses. He says, and what happened was Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt and he had come to the Red Sea and he was stuck between the Israelite, uh, the Egyptians were coming to attack him. And there was this Red Sea in the, in the middle of his way. And so what Moses did is Moses whipped out his cordless radio and he radioed in for help. And then a, a massive bomber jet came past and uh, dropped off a whole bunch of supplies. And the people ate and they had a good time. And then what happened was the next thing, this chopper came. And there were hundreds of choppers. And they lowered these ladders. And all the Israelites 
held onto the ladders and these helicopters flew over the Red Sea and dropped them on the other side. And then the big bomber went back and annihilated the Egyptians. Another sitting there, and she thinks like, not quite how I remember it. So she says to him, Dave, are you sure that's what you learned at Children's Church today? He says, no, mom, but if I try to tell you the story that they told me, you'll never believe it. (laughs) Some of God's word is unbelievable. That's why Sarah, at the age of, what was she, 90, with a husband of 99, is anybody here 99? Anybody 90? I'll stop there. That's why Sarah, at the age of 90, when she is told that she's going to have a child, she thinks, no way. Not only does she think this feels and seems impossible, she actually laughs out loud. She laughs. She says to herself, is this possible that I, after I'm way over the age of childbearing and my husband is way beyond becoming a father, will we really have this pleasure of being parents? Will I really know the pleasure of being a mother? In those days, if you did not have a child as a woman, there was, it was thought that there's something wrong with you. It was thought that God had forgotten you, and it was grounds for divorce. She would have been looked down on by everyone in her life for not having a child. And at 90, she hears, that she's going to have a son. Unbelievable. (laughs) Unbelievable. And how does she respond? She laughs. And she says, this cannot be. She says, there is no way this is going to happen. Do you know how many times in the Old Testament people didn't believe what was going to happen? Think about it. What about Moses? We just told that joke about Moses. Think about Moses. When God goes to Moses and says to him, Moses, you are going to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. What does Moses say? No way. He says, I can't speak. I can't speak in public. He says, I'm not going to be the one that goes and leads them out. You've got the wrong guy. Think about Gideon. Do you know the story of Gideon? He's one of my favorite guys. He was at a And he was busy threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, for those of us who are South African, most of us don't know what it means to thresh wheat in a wine press. The way that they threshed wheat was they would have it on a big sheet and they would throw it up. And the wind would come and it would blow the chaff away. And then the wheat would land on the sheet. And they would do that repeatedly until they had pure wheat in front of them and all the chaff had been blown away. Now, a wine press was generally underground uh, so that the wine could ferment properly and it was dark and it was dingy. And here's Gideon, and we forget to read this. Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. So this guy was so scared of his enemies that he had gone underground to try and thresh wheat. I don't know about you, but there isn't much wind in a bunker underground. I just picture this poor guy. He must have been like throwing it up and blowing, trying to get the chaff away. That's how scared he was of the enemies. And God appears to him and says to him, Gideon, you're going to lead the people against them. And Gideon says, no way. He says, I am the weakest man of my family. My family is the weakest of our, tr- of our clan. Our clan is the weakest of our tribe, and our tribe is the weakest tribe of Israel. In other words, what Gideon says is, God, you've got the wrong guy. I'm the weakest man in Israel. You see, he didn't, it was unbelievable. It's Moses, Gideon. Think of Jonah. When, when God tells him to go to Nineveh, Jonah's like, no ways, I'm not going. He still gets on a boat and goes in the opposite direction. Thomas in the New Testament, when Jesus tells him, when all the disciples say, uh, this is, you know, Jesus has risen from the dead. What does Thomas go? Unless I see the hands with the nail marks and unless I see the, the hole in his side, I will not believe. It is unbelievable. Unbelievable. 
Abraham himself, himself was not so innocent. I love this story. You know, we read the story where Sarah laughed. Listen to what Abraham does just a chapter before that in Genesis chapter 17. Here's how Abraham responds. And so God from verse 15, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Here's how Abraham responds. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? You hear that? We all think, oh, Sarah laughed. Abraham literally fell down. He was laughing so much. The things that God does is unbelievable. But do you notice how many of the people that God worked with uh, found it unbelievable and said so? Moses said, you've got the wrong guy. Gideon said, you've got the wrong guy. Sarah says, I'm way too old. Abraham laughed and said, my wife's too old. Jonah, Thomas, Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad. You see, so many people, when God wanted to do something in their lives, they thought and said out loud to God, it is unbelievable. Are you sure? And how does God respond every time? Every time God engages with a question, God responds, and God still does what God was going to do. Do you see that when Sarah is laughing, uh, God doesn't say to her, well, fine, you don't believe me, I'll go find some other lady at the age of 90. He doesn't say to Abraham, oh, you think it's so funny, I'm going to go find Moses down the road. He he doesn't say to Jonah, you know what, I'm just going to find somebody else. He doesn't say to Gideon, fine, you stay in the wine press, I'm going to go speak to Paul. God doesn't do that. You see, when somebody questioned God, when somebody doubted God, when somebody uh, even laughed at the idea of what God is going to do, every single solitary time, God engages with those people. And he still does what God was going to do. You see, what if every one of those people show us the kind of relationship God wants us to have? What if every one of those people show us how God longs for us to be with God? And you know what that is? Is honest. They were genuine. They were real. They didn't have pretenses and airs and graces. Sarah didn't go, oh, Lord, as you say, so shall it be. She laughed. She said, this is unbelievable. Are you sure? And it was a sign of a genuine relationship. I don't know how many uh, people had children here who used to ask a lot of questions when they were growing up. (laughs) What about that, like, why? <laughs> Everything was why all the time. Like, go brush your teeth. Why? Because if you don't, they're going to fall out. Why? <laughs> Everything. They asked questions all the time. And as a mother, I love that they asked questions because it gave me an opportunity to answer. And we had and have incredible conversations because they weren't afraid to ask. And yet I'm sure that there are parents out there that the children are too afraid to question. And often, when they're too afraid to question, the relationship disintegrates. And when they grow up, 
they aren't that close because they weren't allowed to question. You see, questioning, I'm not saying backchatting, there's a difference. <laughs> I've seen some. <laughs> questioning is good for a relationship. It shows honesty, it shows vulnerability, it shows the realness and rawness. And the characters of the Old Testament, these people, when they laughed at God's suggestion, when they questioned, when they doubted, it was a sign that they were being real with God. Do you know how God responds every time? Is God engages with them, God has a conversation with them, and God still works with them. This is the grace of God. The grace of God says that even when Sarah doubted, he didn't then choose someone else. Even when Sarah laughed, God continued to work in her life, even when Sarah lied to him. God still worked in her life. That is the grace of God. The grace of God says that God will work in our lives even when we doubt. God will work in our lives even when we question. God will work in our lives, hear this, even when we lie. <laughs> I had a friend, have a friend, and uh, this particular friend, when we lived on the church property, he used to drink a lot, like a lot. And when we lived on the church property, he always used to say that he can't come and visit us because if he stepped foot on the church property, lightning would strike him down. <laughs> he genuinely believed this. And for years, this is what he said. And one day, out of the blue, he phoned me. And he said to me, I've had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and I am saved. Even when he was afraid, God worked in his life. Even when he doubted, God worked in his life. Even when he avoided God at all costs, <laughs> God worked in his life. That is the grace of God. And so what does that mean for you and I? Because I don't think any of us are going to be falling pregnant at 99. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> but what does that mean for us? Where do we stand in this story? And this is what I believe. Is, is I believe that this story tells us something about the relationship God desires for us. And that is that God desires that we have a relationship of honesty and vulnerability. That we have a relationship where we're not afraid to say to God, but Lord, this doesn't make sense. That we're not afraid to say to God, but Lord, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Where are you? God is big enough and God's grace is sufficient and God is strong enough to handle our questioning and our doubts and our insecurities, and even our anger. God is big enough to handle our anger. And our, our questioning and our doubting will not stop God's work, because God is bigger than our faith. I remember when I used to do youth ministry, I had a teenage, a bunch of teenagers that I was working with, and I was for months trying to get across to them that prayer is not about airs and graces, but about honesty. Uh, that a relationship with God is not about religiosity, but about relationship. And that the more vulnerable and honest we can be with God about everything that's going on in our hearts and minds, uh, that is what God desires. You know, that's why Jesus says the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is because questioning isn't a bad thing. And so I was trying to, to show them 
about this idea of relationship versus religion and how it's about vulnerability and honesty and, and sharing with God what you genuinely feel and think. And we're on a camp, and one of the young guys, he was about 16, came running up to me, and he said, Louise, I think I get it. I was like, praise Jesus. He says, I think I get it. I said, well, what happened? He said, I think I had a very honest prayer. I said, well, what happened? He said, I was on the beach, and this gorgeous girl walked past. He said, and I sat there, and I went, wow, Lord, she's beautiful. And he said, I realized that I was praying, honestly. And he says, God didn't strike me down. He says, I just realized that God desires to know my heart. And I was like, that's relationship. God doesn't desire for us to have it all together and have all the answers and know everything. God's desire for us is that we would be genuine and honest, that we must laugh when we need to laugh, that we must question when we need to question, because God desires an honest and open heart. And he will work with us to the point where our faith is restored. Growing up, I have a confession to make is that I was the youngest of three siblings, and I really believed that I knew everything. You know when you're the youngest, you try hard to make sure that everyone around you doesn't think you're stupid. You know what I mean? And so every time anybody used to say anything to me, uh, I used to say, I know. I know. All the time. They'd be like, anything. Anything that they said, I would just be like, I know. Until my parents came up, and I'm sure it's illegal, my parents came up with a solution to me saying I know to everything, is what they used to do is they said to me, every time I say the words I know, somebody in the household's allowed to slap me on the forehead. <laughs> I had two older brothers. <laughs> then they said that if I didn't want them to hit me on the forehead, I had to hit myself on the forehead. So I'd walk around and I'd be like, yeah, I know, and I'd hit myself. For years, I walked around, and even when it stopped to be in a habit, I would be in class, and I'd be like, yes, I know, and I'd slap myself. But I've realized that when somebody thinks that they have all the answers, and they know everything, it blocks relationships. And so we are allowed to ask God those questions. Listen to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5 from verse 6 through to verse 7. I'm reading from the message translation. Just hear these words. Peter says, so be content with who you are. Don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. Live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. You hear those words? Uh, don't, be content with who you are. In other words, live our spirituality from a genuineness. Ask questions. Uh, speak to God. Be genuine. Be open, knowing that our doubt will not stop God's work. Our questioning will not prevent God from working in our lives. Be content with who you are. Don't put on airs. In other words, don't try and pretend to be holier than thou. God's strong hand is on you. And then I love this part, live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. When we place our genuine hearts, our genuine souls, in front of God, God is most careful with us because God is great. So may we learn from the story of Abraham and Sarah that God desires our genuine heart that he wants us to be real, 
said it's about relationship and not religion. And when those moments of doubt or questioning come, please remember that God is stronger than our doubts and he will continue to work in our lives even when we fear, even when we doubt, even when we question, even when we laugh and even when we lie. God's grace is sufficient. Let us pray. So loving Father, we we thank you that your grace is sufficient. Thank you that your work is not dependent on us. Thank you that you do use us even when we doubt. But thank you that your work is not dependent on us. Thank you that you invite us into an honest and open relationship with you where we can share the genuine situation of our heart. And may we move from people who practice a religion to people who have a relationship. May we learn to be genuine and vulnerable with you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. I'm going to ask uh, the worship team to come forward as well as the stewards and we are going to worship uh, as we take up the offering. Scars are a sign of grace in our lives, and Father, you have brought us through. When deep were the wounds and dark was the night, the promise of your love you drew. Now every battle still to come, let this be our song. It is well, it is well, with my soul, with my soul, it, it is, is well, it is well, with my soul. Weeping may come, remain for a night, but joy will paint the morn sky you're there in the fast you're there in the feast your faithfulness will always shine now every battle still to come let this be our song it is well it is well with my soul It is well, it is well with my soul. You lead us through battles, you lead us through, battles. You lead us through blessing, you lead us through blessing, and you make us fruitful, and you make us fruitful in the land of our suffering God.
And so, loving Father, we give you these gifts knowing that every good gift comes from you. We pray that you would use them in a mighty and wonderful way in the precious name of Jesus Christ. All God's people said, Amen. Now, before we do the benediction, I'm going to invite you to be seated. Uh, could I ask, are there any uh, prayer requests? Anybody have something on their heart? Please remember to tell me your name as well. Yes. Anybody else have any prayer requests? Yes. yes. Um, I just want to pray for my mom. Um, she's not well. Um, the doctor thinks it's cancer. So. Okay. Any other prayer requests? Yes. I think we should just say a prayer for Louise as well. She was complaining early this morning that her ears had suddenly clamped up. And uh, having just spent about six or seven weeks with that same thing of trying, trying to speak, and it sounds as though you're speaking in a drum, it is not a nice experience. So, Lord, we just ask that you will touch her ears, that you will open it up, and that she will be just fine within a few hours' time, if not right now. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Let us pray. Oh, yes, at the back. Let us pray. Gracious Father, you know our hearts. You know what it is to love. You know what it is to mourn. You know what it is to be afraid. You know what it is to be human in a broken world. And we are so grateful that because of you, Jesus Christ, because of you, you understand us so deeply. And so you understand when we have people on our hearts and our minds and when we lift them up to prayer, you know our hearts and our burdens. And so we pray for Estelle as she's been on such a long journey and now faces a, another round of chemo and radiation. And we just pray, Father, for your strength, for your healing, we ask that you would hold her very closely, that you would allow her to know your presence, that you would be with the doctors and everybody involved, that they would know the best course. And we just pray for your healing. And loving Father, we lift up Abigail and her mom, Margaret, as they face uh, such uncertain times, as they face this fear and worry. And Lord, you promised that you deal with us gently. And so in this season, would you, would you just hold them very closely that they might know something of your peace, that they might know something of your love. Father, we pray that the tests would come back and that they uh, would come back with good news. But let the prognosis not be bad. And Lord, we lift up Con, 
who is not well and is going through a lot. And we just pray that you would hold her in the palm of your hand. That your presence and your spirit would surround her and give her strength. And we also lift up our country. Such a beautiful country with so many gifts and, and such diversity and love and hospitality. But at the moment, Lord, we, we just very aware that our country is a difficult and scary place to live in. And so we pray for the leadership of this country that you would, ri- that you would raise up leaders who are humble and have servant hearts, who are not greedy but are generous with their power and their time and their finances. Father, we pray that you would help those people who've been so negatively affected by load shedding. Some people are so reliant on water and electricity, and and this has been such a difficult time. And so we pray that you would uh, give them creative ways to go around it and work around it, that you would give uh, us patience, but that you would also help our infrastructure, that we could find a balance in this life. And so, gracious Father, we lift up all of these concerns and hearts to you. And we thank you that you hear our prayer and that you answer it. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, Could I invite us to stand as we say and then sing the benediction together? And just a reminder that there is tea and coffee after the service. And so now may the grace Grace of our Lord Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, the love love of God, God, and the the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. do not forget that next week is a combined service at half past eight and come hungry. Thank you. There is a river of gladness that runs from Emmanuel's veins. Sin and not beneath the flood of God's saying. Since then I walk in
I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He's got a hold on my life. I've got Jesus, how good I want more. The love of God gave me his pardon. The love of God won't let me stay the same. 